Good morning. Thank you, Gardner, for those kind words. And good morning, fellow warriors. And indeed, that's probably where I want to start. So uh, a couple of witnesses. Uh, Gardner, you, you used this great language of uh, leaders, leading thinkers. I, I don't know if I would ever have put myself in that category. But Jamie's a witness. I do spend a lot of time thinking. And so I wanted to share with you some of my thoughts today. But it is really this war fighting aspect that uh, got me going when uh, Jeff Harley gave me these words. Strategy and maritime power in a contested environment. This is a current strategy form. And yet the words maritime power in a contested environment I felt was pulling me down to the operational level of war. We often think about and mostly agree to this framework of strategy, operational level, and then tactical level. And so then I started to think, is this forum, has the world changed so much that just like we have strategic corporals, there's no way to talk about the operational level of the war or the tactical level of war without having strategic implications? And then that gets to this very new CS21, where we talk about the sea services and the functions. And it is at the strategic level. But because it is about services, it does talk to operational and mission level concepts. And are those all interconnected today? And then we, we bring in this new idea of all domain access. We put out this premise that there are these multitude of domains, space, air, maritime. And my favorite fight inside the joint arena is whether maritime is one domain or whether air is separate from surface and subsurface. And if you're a light blue suitor and of the Air Force, you kind of want to think air is separate. If you have to fight in the maritime domain, you want all of those to be in one domain because you have to fight in all three dimensions at the same time. And so when we're talking a contested environment, are we talking all of those domains or one of those domains? And so these are the thoughts that were running through my head. And now I'm going to take you through where I think I'm, where I went with my answers for myself. First slide. You know, there's this line that um, history doesn't repeat itself. Historians repeat historians. And so when we're talking all domain access, we're really talking about how we have capability against anti-access aerial denial uh, circumstances. Anti-access, that means we're going to stop you from, from even getting into uh, maneuvering and then area denial. You just can't get in there. And yet, throughout history, this problem of not being able to get in has been, at the tactical level, uh, an issue. Um, and it has been sometimes at the operational level. And so I started to think about our ability in anti-access aerial denial. And when you think about us in the Civil War, there was this great plan by the Union to blockade the South, literally to contain them. And then the thought was, if we can blockade them, we could, we could actually sort of split them up the middle, divide and conquer, so to speak, starve them. The strategic level thinking was that we had to stop the South from being able to sell goods in order to resupply and buy armament. But as they built and contained the South with this blockade, it actually probably another fantastic piece of strategy was literally the Union convinced the rest of the world that it was legally fine to blockade the South uh, and not to intervene. As we got down to the individual ports, some of those ports had strategic importance. One of the last ones being Mobile. And Mobile Bay, it's sort of an arrowhead inlet uh, in the middle. 
you go up through the center and the, the town of Mobile is at the, top of the in, at the top of the bay, 20 nautical miles from the entrance. The point was that Mobile was a railhead. You could take the Ohio Railroad out to Mississippi and you could take the Great Northern Railroad out to Atlanta. So taking Mobile uh, meant that we were going to succeed in containing the South. And it was part of this grand blockade, and it became a strategic point. When Farragut and his um, cruisers and uh, monitors went to take it, he had a thoughtful opponent. And Admiral Buchanan, he had, a narrow, he had a narrow inlet with two forts, one on each side. He drove pilings part way out, and then he mined the rest of it. The channel to get in at that point was only 500 yards wide. And so good old Farragut, who became our first admiral in the Navy, had an anti-access problem. And I don't think there, there had been that much thinking about anti-access. But the mines were there, that referred to as torpedoes in those days. So his plan was simply just to charge right through at great risk. And the first ship that went up to fight the Confederates inside the bay, the Tecumseh, hit a mine. That ship, according to stories, sank in less than a minute, losing 93 people of 124. And that realization, uh, even with hardened, uh, combat-hardened veterans, started to cause the rest of the unions, Union ships to pull over to the side to safety. And literally, it was the leadership bravery of Farragut saying, damn those torpedoes to the seal of the Hartford, and driving up the center. And an awful lot of luck. The Hartford didn't hit a mine, and the rest of the ships fell in behind her, and then the Battle of Mobile Bay was on. So anti-access has probably been around for a while, but what we've come to say is that we have to be able to fight in this domain. The lesson learned is we can't rely on luck in the future, that we'll just uh, time, time and luck find that channel to fight the enemy. We have to be able to have all domain access and be able to burrow in if we need to in order to have the fight. Next slide. We're starting to see some of this play out today. When you look at the Strait of Hormuz, that's still a pretty important energy producer for the world. It's about 17 million barrels a day. But most of that energy flows to the Western Pacific, and the biggest customers are India, Japan, South Korea, China. Important to us because they're our trading partners. And so if energy was disrupted to them, there would be economic impact around the world. And then, of course, some of that oil flows around to our European partners, who are also trading partners. In 2012, Iran threatened to close the Strait of Hormuz. That is an anti-access problem, which, if she had tried to close the Straits, obviously would have re economic repercussions around the world. Since then, NAVCENT has created an exercise, a mine countermeasures exercise, which the first time it was announced, we had European partners join in rapidly and has only grown over the years. And so every fall, we now demonstrate a collective capability to keep the straits open. And this last fall, in November of 2014, we were up to 38 warships from around the world, 32 civilian merchant vessels, and 44 navies represented. There are over 6,500 people in this mine countermeasure exercise. And so then when you look at the strategy and we talk about all of our functions, power projection, that's demonstrated in this exercise. Sea controls, demonstrated in this exercise. Deterrence is demonstrated in this exercise. And our strategy talks about the reliance of allies and partners. In this case, it is collective deterrence. It is all of us working together to signal to Iran that we have the might to keep the strait open, and we're willing to use the might to keep the strait open. 
There are other additional benefits that come out of something, like putting an exercise like this together. Interoperability, which is important to us if we should ever have to go to war and we're gonna fight with allies and partners. And so anti-access is coming to the forefront and not just in the maritime domain, next slide, but it's coming to the forefront in this domain. And I heard Gardner say that Peter Singer's talking tomorrow. If you've never heard him speak, he will give you some great enlightenment about what's going on. This is a, this is a tough domain. And when we talk about contested environments, this domain is like an urban fight. I grew up in a Navy that was deep blue and we had one enemy, the Soviet Union. Life was a lot simpler then. And we were actually pretty happy when that fight went away. We should not have been. Life's a lot easier when you just have one enemy. This domain, this domain has criminals in it. This domain has hackers in it. This domain has honest businessmen in it. This domain has family in it. This is like an urban fight. And there will be a lot of collateral damage should we ever choose to fight in this domain. This is a contested environment. It's aptly illustrated by the cyber attacks on Estonia in 2007 and during April and May. And in the course of three weeks, there was a distributed denial of service attack. And fundamentally, the attackers, who the Estonians later identified as Russian, took a hold of several people's individual computers from around the world and sent uh, droves, literally millions of hits to different websites in Estonia, crashing all of those websites. On 26 April, the first assault happened. And in the first week, all of the websites related to the government and the parliament were knocked offline. By the second week, Major Estonian news publications were all out of business. They couldn't communicate online. The heaviest attack came on May 9th, 2007, the Estonia banking system. Cyber attacks forced Hanasep Bank, the largest bank, to shut down all internet-based operations. At that point in the country, 97% of all banking transactions were online. The hackers servered connections to all of the ATMs throughout Estonia and Estonia debit cards would not work outside of the country. They shut the country down. That meant Estonians couldn't pump gas, get groceries, use cell phones, or make money transactions. The Estonian government immediately accused the Russian government but had difficulty proving it. And so this environment is not only contested, we have the challenge of getting to attribution making it hard for us to counterattack. Who is doing this to us? And when we do figure out there's a latency to it, that means we're too late for the counterattack to defend ourselves. So was this an example of A2AD in this environment? Was this a blockade, a blockade of Estonia in the electronic world, just the way we were blockading the Confederates in the Civil War? And then when you get back to our strategy, and we talk about the reliance on allies and partners, one of the biggest strategic implications out of the Estonia attacks was the only way Estonia could recover was to work with allies and partners. The path of destruction went through several different countries, and that meant internet experts from Germany, Finland, and Slovenia had to help in tracking down the source of the computers in order to get the attack turned off. So we are in a different world, and particularly in this domain, allies and partners come to the forefront, not because we want it to be that way, because that is the way the internet has evolved. And so it is by necessity. The largest, biggest strategic implication to me was the change in Estonia, and now becoming a leader in the cyber domain, and helping the rest of the world understand what policy should be, and how we need to behave. In a leading voice, Estonia stood up the, the Cyber Center of Excellence within NATO. A leading voice in us trying to get to understanding on exactly what does an Article 5 mean in this domain. Next slide. 
And so I think A2 AD has been around for a while. We've got these domains. Some of them have only evolved in the last century like space or the last few decades like the cyber domain. But any one of them could be contested at any time. So where are we as the sea services? And what does it mean in our ability? I think the other historical metaphor is we may be the British in the War of 1812. We're the dominant global power. There may be a conflict far from where we are that we want to say we're going to exert pressure on that nation or we're going to go into war with that nation. And in the War of 1812, the British were able to do power projection. But there were limitations. And they had come to the strategic conclusion that they weren't going to win this fight unless they had allies and partners. And so they ended up partnering with the Canadians and with the Indians. But my biggest strategic takeaways from that is that there's limitations. When you project power into another domain and you're relying on allies and partners who are in their backyard, they will have different motivations during the conflict. And in the case of the Native Americans, they had listened to the promises of the British that they would take care of them, feed them, and provide them weapons. The British were at the, the tail end of their logistic trail and weren't, tail and weren't able to do that. And so the motivations of the Native Americans, it becomes about their home and family. They, in the end, were forced to abandon the fight because of a bad season, and they had to take care of their, their family in order to feed them. And so you're, the motivation of the people who live there, you will have to take that into account when you bring them on as allies and partners. And if you say you're going to support them, promises that trust has to be kept. And then also when I look at where we are and you look at the resource-constrained environment we go to, the War of 1812 is, also has some great lessons in it. One, if you're in a resource-constrained environment and you're power projecting in a contested environment, deception comes to the forefront. Both in the case of the British and in the case of Tecumseh, they use deception to win battles. So for example, as General Hall was sitting up in his fort in Detroit, Tecumseh used the fact that there were openings in the, in the, in the uh, woods and would run his braves by several times. Hull, Hull thought he was outnumbered. The British deliberately sent false orders and had messengers captured talking about troops that were on their way to reinforce them. And literally, in the end, with all of this information coming in, General Hull surrendered without firing a shot. If we are going into a resource-constrained environment, I predict we'll see deception, not surprise, come to the forefront as one of the principles of warfare. And then the, the last piece is in resource-constrained environments, simulation comes to the forefront. We talk about we can't afford to train at sea, we can't afford to fly in the air. We can get to just as good a place with simulation. In the War of 1812, that lack of resourcing and the simulation turned, to be a, turned out to be a factor in the Battle of Lake Erie. The British were getting ready for the battle. They didn't have the shot in order to practice firing cannons. But being smart leaders, they had their sailors go through the motions of firing the cannons. On our side, uh, Commodore Perry, he had them go through the actual sequence firing live shot and sometimes using whatever he could find. On the day of the battle, when the British went to actually fire their cannons, they had simulated everything right down to the long wicks for the largest cannons. They had not actually made the long wicks, and so they were reduced to taking their pistols and shooting them into the cannons in order to ignite them. That put a timing sequence, and they lost the volley of fire they normally would have had. They never knew that they hadn't built the wicks because they'd spent so much time simulating, they never got to the ground truth of what they didn't have. So we're going to see the same thing. As we get to a resource-constrained environment, you will start to see an emphasis on simulation. We as leaders just have to be mindful 
that simulation has its boundaries. And at some point, you do have to operate in the air, you do have to train at sea, and you do have to train underneath the water in order to be a proficient warfighter. Next slide. So this begats a lot of questions. And the point of a forum like this is that we ask these questions and that the answers you find useful, but you also find them useful as warfighters. And so we have the potential of contested environments that we will have to fight in in the future. We have the potential of anti-access anti area denial. And that could be in the maritime domain, that could be in the cyber domain, that could be on the sea, the air, or undersea. We have to ask ourselves, with that particular adversary, is it likely that all of those domains will be contested at the same time? And it's our responsibility as warfighters to understand which domains at what time are going to be contested and where we best leverage our capability. And if the vulnerability of our potential adversary is in one of those domains, leverage our ability to, to master that domain, to take the adversary out in another domain. So we should not be afraid to be asymmetrical. Air against subsurface. Cyber against land. And we have to leverage what we know and what we can do, really understand these domains, really understand if they're contested, and really take advantage of our enemy's vulnerabilities when the time comes. And so I think those types of questions and the answers are useful to all of us as warfighters and as strategists. And uh, with that, I will take your questions. Thank you. Um, so I don't know if everyone uh, heard the question. Thank you, Ambassador, uh, for that question. The, he asked about, uh, he put it in the context of our relationship with the Soviet Union, the 10-year lead time uh, to design and develop systems. Our, I, I think, if I can condense it, the ability of our adversaries to move more quickly, technologically, uh, uh, and then how do, we, how do we manage all of that with the with the, with the budget constraints that we have. Um, so you get, you get to the heart of a question that's actually being played out on the Hill right now. Acquisition reform, who's responsible for requirements? And then who can make changes to requirements as we go along? But the other thing I think about and why I believe in a ship like the littoral combat ship is we have to get out of coupling together combat systems to the platforms and be able to unintegrate what's been our way of doing business. That we have to set up modules so that we can take advantage of changing technology and more, more easily take those C4I systems and upgrade them and the weapon systems and then plug them in where we need to, need to plug them in. Uh, and then that, and then more, have more agility in our ability to train our people. So that's, that's part of the answer. I also agree that the, the Chinese are setting up to create a contested environment in terms of all of, all of the domains. Uh, and so we too are moving out in capacity in terms of air, ballistic missile defense, undersea, and cyber. Uh, the, 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 the issue will be is what will that, how do we think that war is going to unfold? And what domain do we think they're going to have their vulnerabilities in? And I also think when you look at where we are and how for all of us, battle space awareness, command and control, we're all dependent on the networks, not just the U.S., but the Chinese are developing along that way. That will be our opportunity to look at their vulnerabilities in the way they command and control 
their vulnerabilities and how they do battle space awareness and think about how we either go into deception writ large or go into the interdiction of their C2 and battle space awareness uh, and their eye in the sky. So those are all things and areas we, just as they look at us and make decisions about how they want to develop capability, we have to look at them and make decisions about how we want to develop capability as well. And I, I think the same um, grand folks who've helped us work our way through this um, still, still exist. But I think we have to be, with the systems of the future, do more parsing out and have less integration so that we can rapidly bring in technology where we need to, particularly in the cyber domain. My classmates will know that I am not shy about asking questions, Admiral. My name is Kim Kelly. I'm with the Department of State. I'm in the senior class. And we've talked about a lot of these uh, concepts that you've mentioned, the constrained environment, platforms, new weapon systems. As we need to operate more jointly in this contested resource constrained environment, one of the topics that's come up repeatedly throughout the last 10 months is that politics can often get in the way. And we end up with systems that we don't need or want. And I've heard from my military colleagues across the services that oftentimes they get new weapon systems or platforms that are really being sent out because of politics. So what, recommend, rec, what recommendations do you have for us students as we move into greater leadership positions regarding managing the politics to develop joint platforms and new weapon systems that will be useful as we move forward? I don't know that I want more fighters managing politics. That's a <laughs> premise in that question that I don't know I agree with. I think there's civilian oversight, and I think Congress has a role to play, and they have a right to maintain that role. So when I've testified, um, th there is a constitutional, constitutional mandate for Congress to maintain a Navy. The truth of the matter is they will help shape the size of the Navy with the budget that they approve. I think sometimes it's not trying to get into the politics of it. It's helping educate them on what we see as their responsibilities and the impact of their decisions and what it will have on that Navy that they are required by the Constitution to maintain. Um, and I think when it's laid out and the dialogue is in the appropriate framework, I have a role and responsibility. And if you want me to be able to continue control the seas, maintain maritime security, and project power. This is the capability I need. And those are fruitful conversations to have. And then, then they get to be the elected leaders they, they need to be. Good morning, Admiral. My name is Steve Faber. I'm with the Naval Oceanographic Office. And I'm glad to hear you talk about mind warfare, because that's my background. I have a question about uh, China. China is a complex problem. We talk about uh, what they're doing with the Spratly Islands and the islands. We talk about what's happening between Japan and, and them and the Senkakus. And we also talk about the, the Nine Dash Line, or whatever it's called today. And uh, we also talk about them being strategic partners, I mean, uh, uh, commerce partners, because we send a lot of our trade over there. Do you see that there's any kind of a trigger that's really going to start an armed conflict with them? Um, you mean within the next couple of years? Strategically down the line. I mean, we, mean we rely on, on, on them so much right now for our manufacturing that can we even afford to go to a shooting war with them? Even no, economically, them? no. Um, and you guys have probably been dime-filled to death uh, uh, during your time here. And I remind people, dime fills a great acronym, but if you switch the letters around, it's actually midlife, which might indicate a crisis. So uh, we are too entwined economically. And then when you look at the economic capacity of countries, you look at who has growing GDPs or surplus that they want 
they have to be able to lend dollars out. And they need countries that are good uh, recipients, that there's a trust there, like the mortgage banker, that if I give you this money, in the end, I'm going to get the money back. That when we say, sure, buy our bonds, we, we, we mean it, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 years from now, that interest rate will hold true. Who else has an economy that can absorb the ex excess capacity of countries like Saudi Arabia and China? It's us. I mean, theoretically, they could loan to countries like Greece, Italy. They could. But the certainty of that's going to come to fruition at some low interest rate is not there. So we are very intertwined when you look at the sheer volume of, of trade and um, dollars that are, that are, and yen that's being moved around the world. And so that, that is a, we are in an economic symbiotic relationship. Uh, and that is one where, uh, for some of the countries who have a GDP where they can lend, um, for them to do something, they would definitely have to be cutting off their nose uh, to spite. Um, in other areas, one of the things I've been thinking about um, where we have not had a probably broader national di dialogue is strategic deterrence. Nuclear weapons are always there, but they're sort of in the background. Uh, we're well past the time frame where we have folks get under desk and prepare for a nuclear attack. Uh, and so it's faded into the background consciousness of the American public. But China is developing a sea-based triad for strategic deterrence. And so we owe ourselves coming to an understanding of what that means. Uh, we've been in this lockstep uh, relationship with Russia because we developed nuclear weapons and grew up at the same time and we have treaties. So as China develops the sea-based triad, what does that mean for our relationship? Where does the dialogue need to go? And what kinds of understandings do we need to have? To me, that's our biggest vulnerability right now because we don't have the same sort of mature relationship with China on nuclear weapons that we have with Russia. And you think about it, I mean, we're at the war with Russia. There's a, there's a hotline, there's interpreters, and all of that's in place to prevent misunderstanding. So at some point, um, as China goes down this path, I suspect we're going to have to get to that level of maturity. And I think that's probably our biggest immediate vulnerability. Okay, next question. Admiral, good morning, ma'am. Good morning. Commander Sonny Landrum, uh, I'm part of the IDC, Information Dominance Corps, and uh, currently assigned to NGA. Uh, in light of uh, some of our most recent um, breakdowns in security, with uh, information being uh, distributed such as Snowden, where do you see information dominance going in the next 10 years? So the, uh, if you're referring to uh, insider threat, um, we have insider threats that exist in the physical domain. What I'm seeing play out is all of the vulnerabilities we grew up with in the physical domain are coming to, coming to the forefront in the cyber domain. And so there are um, processes and procedures that we've used in the physical domain that eventually we're going to have to figure out how to apply to the cyber domain. The biggest challenge we have with the cyber domain is the lack of policy and, and guidance and uh, on, on an international level. And it has to be on an international level. We, we grow up as war fighters very grounded in the geographic thinking about boundaries that we can uh, influence at the tactical and the operational level. This is, is a domain that decoupleized geography from tactical and operational effects. But the same thing then is true when you're looking at trying to get to solution sets. You know, you may want to go after an adversary, but the, the route of success may take you through somebody else's commercial satellite owned by a private company in another country 
and servers that are in completely different countries. That's what Estonia found out. And so we have got to get to international agreement and norms on what it means to work, operate, and innovate in this space. And so I think the leadership responsibility is to help push that to the forefront. The other issues, there are, there are answers that we can apply from the physical domain to that domain. What we owe ourselves is the good thinking of, as this domain matures, there's still some of the same vulnerabilities we see in the physical domain haven't yet shown up in this domain, but they're coming. And so we have time to think about it and say, what will our response bill or response bill be, or what should capability should we be developing? But it is a challenge. I, I, I refer to this domain as um, the wild, wild west. And, uh, uh, and, you know, there really is no white herb right now. I mean, that's one of our challenges. And I was on a panel um, a few weeks ago with um, Chris Monday of, of Microsoft. And in terms of, of being exploited, he, he phrased it this way. There's, there's, there's just two types of companies in the world, those that have been hacked and those that don't know they've been hacked. Uh, and, okay, if expert talks, you probably ought to listen. Uh, and then that just means we have, to, we have to double down and apply ourselves in this domain and get smarter. Yeah. I do. Um, last question. Um, I happen to be chairing the Cyber Task Force here for the Foundation, so we're very pleased to hear you address front and center the importance of cyber. Um, you mentioned the absence of policy, and clearly that is an issue, not just within Department of Defense, but uh, more broadly within our national security. You also mentioned in your uh, presentation simulation. We're here at the Naval War College, which is the home of Navy strategic thought. We also have fantastic academic resources, but wargaming simulation expertise going back into the, the early part of the century. What is the vision that you and the CNO and the top Navy leadership have for this institution in cybersecurity policy and the use of these very differentiated and scarce resources in simulation? So for us, for simulation, this is a joint answer because right now anything we do in this domain beyond defense is not just a joint answer, it's, a, it's an interagency answer. And so we're going down the path, DOD is to the development of cyber ranges. And, and we do need cyber ranges. We need enclaves where people can practice their trade craft. Um, I heard the superintendent at Annapolis talk yesterday, the, uh, they just, uh, this past year, took the Cyber De Exercise Defense Cup. And the way he got there is they created a small enclave within Annapolis where the midshipmen could go practice their actual network skills uh, in a safe environment. So we're going to end up going down the same path that just as you have a physical training range, we're going to need cyber training ranges. The good news is it's an environment where people don't necessarily have to travel to be able to use the training range but we're gonna to have to develop those. Uh, and I appreciate the reminder that the War College as well as NPS have a lot of expertise in this area. And Gardner will tell you along with Ron Rout, I have not been uh, afraid to tap into that expertise uh, to help us move forward as war fighters in this domain. And so let me end with that. No matter what domain we grew up with, whether we, it was under sea, on the surface, or in the air, in the future as warfighters, those are the domains we'll operate in and potentially the domains we'll fight in. All cyber is, is another domain that we have to be aware of as we operate in the physical domain, we'll be fighting in that domain simultaneously. And so it's made us into fourth dimensional warfighters. We have to recognize that and be prepared to do both at the same time. So thank you for that question. <laughs>